We appreciate your making time in the middle of your day. This is the Frankie Lectures in the Humanities at the Whitney Humanities Center at Yale. The title of the series is The Value of Marx's Capital. In there somewhere is the idea that the people who are presenting will be rethinking the value or revaluing different parts of Capital Volume 1 um, based on their own work, based on the needs of the moment. The series is a companion to an undergraduate seminar at Yale and also goes along with the work that I'm doing as a co-editor, but really that the new, the translator of a new English edition of Capital Volume One, my colleague Paul Ryder at OSU is doing to bring out a lot of the values that got hidden in the older translation. So the new translation of Capital Volume One translated by Paul Ryder should be out in a couple of years with Princeton. Um, so Paul is here and he's gonna help me um, discuss. We need to thank a few people. First of all, the Frankie family who uh, make these lectures possible, specifically Richard and Barbara Frankie, who endow these lectures to present important topics in the humanities to a wide and general audience. I wanna thank Alice Kaplan, the director of the Whitney Humanities Center, who's beginning to do amazing things in her new position there. Sandra Malan Bowles, who allowed this to happen through all of her work. Leanna Hirschfeld Crowen, who's the graduate assistant, and Audrey Leek, who is the undergraduate assistant running the tech. What we're gonna do is um, have a presentation which will be interactive with our guest, Professor Lucia Pradella from King's College London. After that, students in the seminar will get a chance to ask questions first and to make their comments. So they will put their comments and questions in the chat and then we'll give them the first, first dibs. After that, anyone else who's in the room wants to ask questions, I'll ask you to hold your questions until it's Q&A time. Otherwise they get lost in the Q, and I'm not nearly adept enough to keep that all in order. So I'll signal you, you can write down your questions on a pad or on your, on your screen somehow, and then you can post them and we'll get to you and hopefully get to everyone. Okay, so I wanna start as I've been starting these with a quote from the author, and this is it. It's provocative and I think true. Quote, Marx was among the first European intellectuals who supported the struggles of the colonized. Marx's learning from the South made a difference in his understanding of global development and global history. Not only did Marx become aware of the strength of the Asian economies, he also denied the inevitability of colonialism in China. Looking at China's living tradition of peasant revolts, he saw the need for a national revolution that could spark and link up with a social revolution in Europe. And here's the, the um, peak of this thought. Colonized peoples thus appeared as subjects not only of their own history, but also crucially of world politics. This is a line from an article by Professor Lucia Pradella, who has spent a lot of time reconstructing Marx's views about um, what seemed to be marginal in a European theory it turns out to be a global theory and a lot of what has been called marginal is really central for Marx and has force in its own right. Lucia Pradella, who is with us today, is a senior lecturer in international political economy at King's College London. She has a PhD from the University of Naples and Paris Dies in Nanterre. She collaborated on the historical critical edition of Marx and Engels complete works in German which is a high distinction. Um, and she's written two books on capital. The second book, I'll mention the title, Globalization and the Critique of Political Economy, New Insights from Marx's Writings, fits right into our topic, the value of Marx's writings. She is discovering new value in the text all the time. She works on the understanding of capitalist globalization, of colonialism and anti-colonial resistance in light of Marx's still unpublished notebooks in that book. Professor Pradella has published extensively on labor, migration, imperialism, and alternatives to neoliberalism. And she's one of the editors of the Routledge Handbook of Marxism and Post-Marxism, which should be out soon. I'm gonna turn it right over to her 
for a presentation entitled Capital, a Book of Labor. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for this introduction. And thanks for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. And um, so I try to um, uh, present my topic, which is um, I'm going to share my screen with you now in a slightly um, more original way, uh, or maybe to adapt to the new Zoom era. So what I'm trying to do today is to basically discuss different interpretations of Marx's capital and um, um, trying to analyze with you the, the role of labor within, within capital. And I, I just wanted to start by asking you, please, to, um, if you can, I'm going now to uh, post something in, in this chat. So if you can click on the link that uh, will appear on the chat, and if you can tell me uh, what Marxist capital is about uh, from, from your point of view. Let me just send this. So I just give you two minutes if you could just type um, the first two words that come to your mind when um, we mention Marxist capital. Um, and then this should appear in, um, in a window. Yeah, please don't type them in the, in the chat. Try to click the link that I just sent you. Okay. Are the responses? Oh, look at that. Okay, so um, this is basically the word cloud with the words that uh, you are still, uh, I think, typing in. But I think we can see that um, among the most um, kind of um, popular words are probably value, exploitation, labor, capitalism, surplus value accumulation, critique, um, exchange, domination, time, economy, alienation. Well, I, I think this is quite interesting. Uh, it's a quite, uh, quite interesting cloud, cloud of words. And um, let me just go back to my um, to my presentation. Um, yes. So I think that several authors have tried to discuss um, what the content of Marxist capital or the object of analysis of Marxist capital is. And for many scholars, and I think this is also reflected somehow in, in the word cloud that uh, we kind of produce together, there is uh, some attention to labor and so on, but the main idea is really that uh, capital is a book, book about capitalism, about exploitation, about value, and, and, and so on. And um, a group of scholars like um, Nancy Fraser or Titi Bhattacharya um, have criticized Marxist capital and argued that uh, capital would be mainly concerned with the abstract labor or labor power in the form in which it is useful uh, to capital. And um, for these authors, uh, Marx uh, left uh, social reproduction out of the picture and this narrow focus on exploitation would basically uh, close off the analysis of spaces of resistance, which is Michael Leibovitz's uh, argument. And for Nancy Fraser, echoed by David Harvey, uh, we would need to expand our understanding of anti-capitalist struggles beyond the traditional Marxist canon and so look not just at uh, struggles uh, between uh, labor and capital at the point of production, but also at boundary struggles over gender domination, ecology, imperialism, and democracy. 
And my argument today is that Capital is not really a book about capital, but it's a book against capital. And in the last instance, it's a book that um, analyzes the antagonism between two social systems, so between capitalism and communism. And not seeing these, from my point of view, results from the same reifying processes that Marx is at place in the uh, commodity uh, fetishism. So in order to somehow defetishize uh, the reading of capital, uh, I will first uh, um, start by discussing Marx's concepts of labor and exploitation. And I will argue that these concepts are crucial to disinter uh, capital's emancipatory potential and read it from the point of view of the community of free producers that Marx uh, introduces at the end of this um, section on commodity fetishism. I will then explain why, from my point of view, uh, the part on capital reproduction is key to understanding the global scope of Marx's analysis, including imperialism and social reproduction. And I will conclude by discussing what this tells us about uh, Marx's conception of the class struggle and uh, social revolution, both in the 19th century and today. And before I start, I need to make a premise because many people believe that Marx was analyzing 19th century uh, England in Capital Volume 1. But there Marx also says that he is using England as a model to analyze the overall tendencies of capitalism. And I think this is an important point that we need to uh, bear in mind, which uh, ha helps also explain why the more capitalism develops, the more relevant Marx's analysis seems to be. It's because he's looking at overall tendencies and not just a specific historical model. Okay, so it's clear that Marx devoted quite a lot of attention in capital to uh, labor exploitation. But one could ask whether this uh, focus on labor exploitation really closes off uh, spaces of resistance. And I think it's important to bear in mind that uh, for Marx, labor is an organic metabolism between uh, humankind and nature. And from his point of view, contrary to the classical economist, wealth derives from both uh, labor and nature, not uh, from labor alone. And by selling their labor power, workers transfer onto capital their whole living power. So they put this organic metabolism between humankind and nature uh, in the hands of capital. And by doing so, really, um, this creates a complete um, overthrowing of the relationship between uh, humankind and nature. And this is why for Marx in proportion uh, as capital accumulates the situation of the worker, be his payment high or low, must grow worse, yeah? So it's both a qualitative and qu uh, quantitative uh, process of impoverishment. So even assuming uh, that workers are paid what's necessary to cover their subsistence and reproduction costs, the value of the wage for Marx is always lower than the value that workers produce in the production process. And from the moment they enter the hidden abode of production, capitalists consume their labor power with the exclusive goal of expanding the surplus labor time and increasing the extraction of surplus value. And that's why the development of the productive forces aims at creating a uniform and continuous time of valorization that renders labor a purely abstract and mechanical activity. So in volume uh, one, from my point of view, and uh, I suggested reading uh, the chapters from cooperation to uh, large scale industry, so those chapters aren't just describing historical stages in the development of capitalism, but are also highlighting the fundamental contradictions of such development. And Marx shows that capitalism 
renders work a source of mortification rather than uh, human fulfillment, and that it impoverishes the workers, turns them into a fragment of themselves and separates manual and intellectual tasks, enslaving science under capital. So it's really an analysis of the progressive subordination of labor or substantial of labor under capital. And this process um, proceeds hand uh, in hand with the exploitation and squandering of nature. And this is why, from my point of view, Marx's theory of exploitation concerns the totality of capitalist social relations and has an important ecological dimension that uh, resonates today, for example, in the studies of scholars like Rob Wallace or John, John, John Bellamy Foster and other scholars who have shown that the spread of uh, pandemics like COVID-19 are linked to industrial agriculture and deforestation. And so from, from this point of view, COVID-19 would therefore point to the limits of capitalism as an ecological, an ecological system as well. Okay. Let me. So, um, for Marx, one of the fundamental goals of the development of productive forces is to repress uh, workers' resistance that grows along with the cooperation of uh, workers. And uh, for Marx, cooperation is not again just a historical phase but it's the fundamental form of the capitalist mode of production. And it's con the condition for the development of the productive forces. So in his uh, point of view, cooperation takes place when numerous uh, workers work together side by side in accordance with the plan, whether in the same process or in different but connected processes. So I want to show you this slide that uh, basically visualizes somehow part of the supply chain of an iPhone today, yeah? So you can see here that um, Apple designs the iPhone in California and then it supplies parts that are produced all over the world and uh, are then assembled in, in China, in Shenzhen. Uh, by Foxconn. So now I have another quiz for you, another question, and I'm curious to see what, what you think about this. Let me just find it. So what I would like to hear from you in this kind of uh, silent way is whether you think that uh, Foxconn, uh, so that uh, workers along the Apple supply chain cooperate or not. So this is the link. It's just a yes or no. Okay, there is a kind of, people uh, are a bit split here, so please vote. Uh, use your voice. Don't miss this opportunity. I will now post this and yes, it. they cooperate. Post. Well, so do you see the results? Okay, according to, do you see the slide with the results? Yes, okay. So according to a majority, but quite slim majority, only, yeah, to 35 of you, uh, they do cooperate. Well, for 27, uh, they don't cooperate. And for nine, well, nine people don't know really about it. Uh, they, they are not sure about it. All right, so I will tell you my interpretation and then we can discuss whether um, you agree or, or not. Let me just um, resume. Okay. 
Okay, so, well, actually, um, in capital, uh, Marx um, tell, tells us that uh, workers, and if, you, if we go back to, to the previous slide here, sorry. Um, so he says that workers cooperate uh, when they work together in accordance with a plan, whether in the same process or in different but connected processes. So um, I, from my point of view, this means that workers cooperate even if uh, they don't work in the, in the same location or in a single workplace, but even if they work in different and connected locations. So for example, in the case of Apple, they are brought together by capital control over the labor power, uh, but not, not necessarily for, um, by physical proximity. And also in some passages in the Grundrisse, Marx argues that uh, the means of transport are part of the direct production process, yeah? So he seems uh, to subsume space and uh, the accumulation process. So from my point of view, but um, I, I'd be happy to, to listen to, to what you think. So this means that uh, in this case, workers are indeed uh, cooperating, even if they are not working in a, in a single factory, but uh, they are spread uh, all over the world. And uh, there is an important point about cooperation because for Marx, by cooperating, workers become members of a collective worker. So he calls this a Gesellschaftlicher Arbeiter. And he also said that workers strip off the fetters of their individuality and develop the capabilities of their species. So for Marx, cooperation is really a very important aspect of capitalist production relations that is also potentially emancipatory. But the problem is that under capitalism, this unprecedented development of human capabilities empowers capital that is a force that dominates and exploits both uh, the workers and, and the environment. Okay, I, I just want to move now, and maybe this is also linked to the question of really what is capital, uh, Marx looking at in, in capital. Because, uh, well, I think that in order to discuss this point, uh, which is really about the field of analysis and uh, of capital volume one, uh, the part seven on the process of accumulation of capital is quite important. And this part shows that if we look at the process of reproduction of capital, the apparent uh, autonomy of capital uh, disappears. So if we look at the reproduction of the process, um, capital doesn't exchange with uh, the workers a kind of independent sum of value, but is actually uh, exchanging the very value that workers create. So capital appears to be entirely the product of uh, wage labor, not an independent uh, social force. So are, it's actually the workers who create capital as the force that oppresses and exploits them. And uh, at the beginning of chapter 24 on the conversion of surplus uh, value into capital, Marx adds uh, this uh, very important, from my point of view, footnote where he argues, well, here we take no account of export trade by means of which a nation can change articles of luxury either into means of production or means of subsistence and vice versa. In order to examine the object of our investigation in its integrity, free from all disturbing subsidiary circumstances, we must treat the whole world as one nation and assume that capitalist production is established everywhere and has taken possession of every branch of industry. Okay, so I have another question for you. So I found this passage particularly puzzling, really, because, uh, well, I, I spent a lot of time actually trying to understand what does it really mean here, right? 
And so I'm just giving you a few options, a few options. Okay. So you can find these options if you click here. So I think what has probably been the most um, dominant interpretation of this is that Marx is analyzing a national economy. So he's abstracting from the world market and looking at England in isolation from the rest of the world. And here you have uh, Lenin, Rosa Luxemburg, David Harvey, a lot of people assuming that that's the case. Or he could be analyzing a completely globalized system where national and global levels coincide. So he says, uh, what does he say? Um, we must treat the whole world as one nation. Or he could just look at the capitalist, uh, capitalist economy in the abstract and so at this level of abstraction, really, the national and the global levels don't really matter. What do you think? Okay. So I must say that my position, my interpretation is a minority here. But at least I'm very happy because the David Harvey's interpretation is losing. So only four people believe that uh, he's analyzing a national economy, which is an achievement for me after many years of debates. So, okay, um, we just uh, assume he's not analyzing a national economy, which is good news. Uh, but a majority believes that he's actually looking at a capitalist economy in the abstract, while the second uh, most popular uh, answer is that he's looking at a completely globalized system. Okay. Mm. Well, I think this is a plausible uh, it's a plausible interpretation that um, he's looking at the, at the, at the um, capitalist economy in the abstract. Although I, I think that um, the idea of treating the whole world uh, as one nation somehow makes me think uh, something different so that the na national and the global level still, still matters, still matters in, in Marx's analysis. And also, in my, in my, in my, from my point of view, basically posing this coincidence between the national and the global level actually allows you to understand the process of expansion from the national to, to the global level. And the, uh, from this point of view, uh, it's, it's quite interesting what uh, Marx uh, argues in, in Capital Volume 1 in the same chapter, because he argues that uh, the incorporation of new lands, for example, or the control over a larger population or the application of science allows, allow for an expansion of capital's field of accumulation independent of uh, its actual levels of, de of development. And so this uh, seems to say that actually capital isn't bound to a given a territory and the more it grows the more it becomes concentrate and becomes concentrated in fewer hands the more its field of accumulation expands think for example of mergers and acquisitions or the mobility of uh, finance capital and contrary to widespread belief that uh, marx uh, believed in the equalizing tendencies of the of the system the fact that uh, the process of concentration and centralization of capital takes place at the global level has actually a polarizing tendency because capital tends to become centralized in the centers of the world economy where higher value added production activities are also concentrated. And Marx argues in volume three that uh, investment in the colonies or in today's low wage countries is a major factor that helps counteract the tendency of the rate of profit to fall and also another way of, uh, of, of counteracting this tendency is to find new sources of cheap 
raw materials. And uh, from my point of view, this kind of analysis helps explain both contemporary processes of extractivism and also the major shift of production, of industrial production to the global south that has occurred in the neoliberal period. Well, this chart on the um, top left hand side by uh, John Smith actually shows that uh, from the mid 70s, the industrial workforce in the global south has outnumbered that uh, in the north. And according to the World Bank's uh, 2019 World Development Report, industrial jobs are further falling in uh, high, high income countries, which are the uh, orange line, while they're further increasing in, um, in, in East Asia, while the total uh, labor force has been increasing across, across the globe uh, over the last, uh, really 20 years. So um, extractivism um, and this global shift of production to the global south mean an increasing reliance of Western capital on the super exploitation of workers in the south, which is something that Marx um, basically discusses, especially in his 1861-63 uh, manuscript, anticipating from my point of view, analysis about the relationship between dependency and uh, super exploitation by scholars like uh, Rui Mauro Marini. Okay, so I think I need to move on. Uh, and I want to discuss another point, uh, another common view, that is that for Marx, the, pro the violence of primitive accumulation or so-called primitive accumulation would recede with the maturing of capitalism, which is what uh, Silvia Federici or David Harvey argue. But these kind of readings historicize the chapter on primitive accumulation and uh, miss its systemic um, content. And I also miss, I, I'm sure you already know this passage, but the examples of primitive accumulation in, in this uh, very famous uh, passage from the chapter uh, on the um, genesis of industrial capital, for example, the opium wars against China didn't take place in the pre-industrial period, but they actually took place between the 1830s and the 1860s. So this was full industrial capitalism. So from my point of view, this uh, shows that for Marx, industrial capitalism doesn't eliminate the methods of so-called primitive accumulation, but subsumes them um, under its logic. And in particular, in the industrial period, the violence of economic compulsion is so powerful that it takes a priority over direct violence. And this is really because of the perverse tendencies of the system, which pushes more and more people into the reserve army of labor. And these kind of processes for Marx were taking place both in England, but also in the colonies, where in his view, the profound barbarism of bourgeois civilization uh, went naked. So in colonial India, for example, the combination of colonial domination and industrial capitalism ruined what was previously the great workshop of uh, cotton manufacturing of the world. And as Mike David, uh, um, Davis showed in late, late Victorian Holocausts, in the last, last quarter of the 19th century, the combination of colonialism and capitalism led to an increase in rural poverty, exacerbating famines and uh, causing mass starvation among the population. And so these continuous and uh, constant processes of dispossession for Marx feed the global reserve army of labor and the traffic in human flesh that he's, in, from his point of view, the capitalist world labor market. Yeah, so these this kind of continuous processes of dispossession basically feed the global reserve army of labor. And the global reserve army of labor, from his point of view, plays a fundamental role in, in production because it affects labor in multiple ways. And in particular, the expansion of the reserve army puts pressure 
unemployed workers, allowing capitalists to push down wages and also to increase labor exploitation in a vicious circle of overwork and uh, unemployment that takes place really not just at the national but also at the global level. Okay, so just we go back to the to the question of whether Marx really leaves social reproduction out of the picture. Well, from my point of view, it's Marx himself in Capital Volume One who criticizes the classical economists for leaving out such a uh, reproduction. And uh, he describes capital as an animated monster which begins to work as if its body were by love possessed. And he also uses biblical, biblical metaphors like talking about money that differentiates itself as original value from itself as surplus value, just as God the Father differentiates himself from himself as God the Son, although both are of the same age and form, in fact one single person. And I think that this uh, kind of language seems to be an implicit critique of the market approach of the classical economists who reduce economic relations to market relations between private individuals and therefore assume their existence that take it for granted and leave social reproduction out of the picture. And this um, kind of approach um, is fully criticized by Marx, who starts from a completely different point of view. And uh, he argues, as we discussed earlier, that by selling their labor power, workers are actually uh, transferring onto capital their entire productive power, including their reproductive power. And this kind of transfer becomes even clearer uh, if we look at the process of capital reproduction from a social point of view, and uh, in its continuous uh, flow. Because uh, if we do this, we see that throughout their lives, uh, workers uh, exchange uh, with capital their entire labor power. So the fact that capital is buying it uh, piece by piece instead of a mass like, uh, like with the slave, uh, it's actually a source of precarity and dependence on the part of the worker but the result is always a condition of wage slavery, according, according to Marx. And so um, this shows that substantially there isn't a substantial difference with slavery itself, and uh, the antagonism between capital and wage labor also includes the sphere of life-making activities and, and social needs. And the gender dimension of this antagonism between even clearer for Marx in the industrial period when uh, really he says the labor of women and children was the uh, first result of the capitalist application of machinery. And Marx shows how this developed in a complete antagonism with uh, uh, family labor and the social needs of, uh, of the workers at the time. Um, Marx also shows that although capitalism undermines the economic foundations of the patriarchal family, it also relies on it to ensure its privatized reproduction. And this can worsen patriarchal domination from some points of view, but at the same time, it also empowers women and children and creates the conditions for overcoming the patriarchal division of labor as part of the process of overthrowing capitalism itself. So, of course, this brings me to the question I anticipated of the class struggle uh, according uh, to Marx. And it is also quite well known that Marx puts forward quite an optimistic view at the end of Capital Volume 1, when he argues that with the development of capitalism, there is increasing class polarization, and so the revolt of the working class grows, and uh, this um, growing revolt is, growing, is due to the fact that accumulation is due to increasing cooperation, which is the basis of it and the cooperation favors uh, working class consciousness and organization. And so this process of cooperation uh, actually creates 
the conditions for the expropriation of the expropriators. So I, I don't know how much time I have, Paul. We don't have a, a um, formal requirement, really. Nobody's um, cracking the whip over us or you, but we want to give people enough time to ask questions. So if you want to take a little more time, that's great. If you want to stop and take some questions and go back to something, that's also terrific. No, I think I need around 10 minutes to conclude. Yeah, maybe I will leave this. Uh, I, had, um, I had another question for you, but um, I, I was just curious, maybe we can discuss it later, whether this idea of the expropriation of the expropriators still makes sense today with billionaire wealth skyrocketing, especially in the wake of the pandemic and the rich not paying taxes. But maybe this is something we will we'll discuss later on. So what I want to do now is basically to engage with this, this question, right? Because Marx seems really optimistic to hear. He presents this like there is the kind of natural necessity. And, and so this is quite a problematic part, I think, of, of volume one. And the traditional interpretation of this passage is that for Marx, um, uh, industrialization leads to the concentration of uh, production in big factories, the concentration of workers in, in industrial cities. And, and so these um, really would translate in the growing class consciousness and making basically such a revolution in, inevitable. But uh, according to the kind of dominant point of view, this kind of interpretation or view of the dynamic of working class power would be obsolete given the shift of industrial production towards East Asia and declining power of the working class in the West. And so this would be one of the many Marxist predictions that proved com to be completely obsolete. But from my point of view, Marx's argument is a bit uh, more complex uh, than this. And I'm just moving to the, to the next slide. Well, the first thing to say about this is that for Marx, the movement for the reduction of the working day is the premise for any advancement of the working class. And the demand for shorter hours is key because it targets the link between exploitation and impoverishment that is at the center of the process of capital accumulation and creates the conditions to build solidarity between employed workers and the unemployed, native born and immigrant workers, and also between different genders and uh, generations. In particular, working time is key to link struggles around production and social reproduction, and is a demand that the labor movement put forward in different national contexts and also became part of an international struggle. Uh, for Marx, uh, support for the most oppressed workers is crucial for the advancement of uh, the working class. And in particular, he makes the example of English uh, white uh, male workers who on the one side behaved like a sla a slave dealers selling their children and wife, but also uh, Marx notes that it was their struggle that achieved the shortening of working hours for women and children, which also ended up benefiting male adult workers. And the extension of factory legislation put an end to the most extreme forms of exploitation in the domestic industry, which were kind of 19th century sweatshops that relayed on the patriarchal family brutally to exploit women and children. And so the, the extension of uh, factory legislation enhanced the process of concentration of production in big factories and industrial centers, which resulted from an interplay of technological and political factor, factors. So from this point of view, the, work, the class struggle is not a secondary factor in the development of capitalism, but actually shapes capitalist development itself. And for the same reason, I, we could say that the process of concentration of industrial production in big, in big factories or industrial centers is not definitive. And Marx was actually quite aware of this. And in the 1867 address that he wrote on behalf of the International, uh, the General Council to its Lausanne Congress, 
he argues that in order to oppose the workers, the employers in England either bring in workers from abroad or else transfer manufacture to countries where there is a cheap labor force. Yeah. So it's not like he wasn't aware of processes of production restructuring, but by presupposing capital's field of action to be fully globalized, from my point of view, capital makes it possible to understand what Beverly Silver called the dialectic between workers' resistance to exploitation and capital efforts to overcome that resistance by constantly revolutionizing production and social relations. So this constant process of spatial reorganization that is a part of this dialectic is however based on labor cooperation and so it connects laborers all over the world and creates new sources of structural power for workers. So at the same time it uh, weakens from some points of view but also empowers workers in a new way. And an example of this uh, are the struggles of um, immigrant, uh, labor wor uh, immigrant workers in the logistics sector, both in the United States, but I studied in particular Italy, uh, that even if they're often very precarious and um, dependent on their document and so in a kind of Im so immigrant status, Logistic workers have a huge potential to disrupt supply chains uh, through strikes and blockades. And so for an Italian trade unionist, uh, Aldo Milani, in a warehouse where fresh food is stored, a four hour blockade means between 200 and 300,000 euros lost. Yeah? And this kind of disruptive potential helps explain why over the last 10 years, the, mo the movement of logistics workers in Italy has been able to achieve substantial improvements in both wages and working conditions, even though the condi labor conditions uh, more generally in the country have, um, have worsened quite, quite substantially. And I think that this kind of contradiction reemerges now in the wake of uh, Global 19, because on the one side, the pandemic is leading to a massive job crisis with uh, mass unemployment increasing the competitive pressures on workers. And so in this way, the pandemic is revealing the ecological and economic dimensions of Marx's law of impoverishment of the working class. But at the, on the other side, the pandemic has also revealed the essential importance of jobs that are undervalued or not valued at all. Like for example, agricultural work often performed by undocumented immigrant workers or care, works, uh, care work by women in, in the family. So I have a question here uh, if you want to, to answer. So whether from your point of view, um, the pandemic is only weakening labor or is also creating new sources of workers' power. Let me look at the chat here. Sorry. Okay, so yeah. So a majority believes that it's actually doing both. Yeah, so 37 against six for weakening labor and five increasing workers' disruptive power. Okay, which is interesting. Okay. Okay, so um, so I think, I mean, this, this, my presentation today really wanted to highlight the global scope of Marx's understanding of, of the class struggle. And I think that this has really always characterized uh, Marx's conception of the class struggle. 
But over time, Marx became increasingly aware of the challenges to international solidarities uh, in the context of imperialist and racialized violence. And it is therefore no coincidence or no accident from my point of view that volume one doesn't end with the expropriation of the expropriators, but with a chapter on the modern theory of colonization. And um, so um, I, I liked it when uh, Paul was, was reading some of the passages about the importance of anti-colonial struggles um, in Marx um, already in the early 50s when Marx supported the uprisings in China and India against British colonialism and actually believed that they could either react on Europe and accelerate the tendency towards crisis and revolution or they could be the premise for the capitalist national development of these countries. And Marx also followed enthusiastically the development of the civil war in the United States. And as black abolitionists like Frederick Douglass, he believed that the outcome of the war depended on the mobilization of African Americans, and therefore it depended on the emancipation of, of the slaves. And this emancipation, in his view, was the premise for any further progress of the labor movement, because as it's well known, uh, from his point of view, labor in white skin cannot emancipate uh, itself when it is branded in a black skin. And indeed, the movement for the eight hour day immediately grew uh, in the US after the end of the civil war and then spread uh, to Europe. So when Marx discusses the movement for the reduction of the working day, he's not, he doesn't have in mind a pure class struggle that, uh, between bourgeoisie and proletariat that proceeds in linear way, ways in separate national context, but he has in mind this international movement against both exploitation and oppression. At, at the end of the 60s, Marx changed his mind on the relationship between proletariat and anti-colonial struggles. And so while initially in the manifesto, he proclaimed that such a revolution was key to the liberation of the colonies, 10 years after he was discussing with Angus the dangers that uh, Britain's exploitation of the world would create a bourgeois proletariat silent or complicit with this domination. And at the end of the 60s, he concluded that the independence of Ireland was the premise for the emancipation of the working class in, in England. So it was really in the colonies that there was the key to the class struggle, even in the centers of, of the system. And support, working class support for the independence of Ireland was also the condition for opposing the anti-Irish racism that was sparked by the ruling classes in, in England. And, um, and that's in, interesting because it's in the same period that, that Marx also realizes that uh, such a revolution in, is impossible without women. And so he's actually paying more and more attention to the role of women within the revolution and helps draft the program of the Workers' Party in France in, in 1880 that actually includes demands for such a responsibility for the care of older people and disabled people and so for a kind of sharing of the tasks of social reproduction. And I just, um, I just believe that uh, Marx's reflections and study of Ireland uh, were also kind of, um, uh, he was actually, um, in the light, it was in the light of the experience in the United States and the outcomes of the American Civil War that Marx um, decides to take a more explicit stand on Ireland and uh, comes to a clearer and clearer understanding that resisting exploitation requires opposing different forms of imperial violence and uh, racist oppression. And so I just wanted to conclude with um, the address that the international sent to uh, the people of the United States, uh, an address that was written with the input of uh, Marx himself that advocated a policy of radical reconstruction, including full citizenship rights uh, for, for black Americans. 
And uh, Du Bois actually uh, underlined that the, what he calls a bold address contained also a warning so that uh, if people of the US didn't immediately declare blacks free and equal without any reserve, they would sooner or later face a new struggle which will uh, once more drench their country in blood. Yeah? So there is this kind of increasing awareness that uh, it's impossible to oppose exploitation without resisting uh, imperialism and racism, which I think is still very important today when we think about uh, the relevance of Marx. Thank you. This is the moment where <clears throat> everyone would applaud. And I know scholars don't live for the applause, applause but it really feels good. So I want to thank you. Imagine a room of 100 people applauding for a tremendously hopeful presentation. Uh, I want to give my colleague and collaborator, Paul Ryder, a chance to engage you to ask a question. And I have a question for you, too. And perhaps we can ask the students from the seminar to put their questions into the chat at this moment, either privately to me or to everyone, and then we will go to those questions and unmute you. Paul, do well, you want to? Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for that, that presentation. Um, I'm rethinking a lot of passages from Capital uh, as, as I ask this question, which is maybe not the best thing to do, <laughs> um, but uh, it really is uh, literally very thought-provoking what you said. and. And certainly for me, uh, this, this uh, a, a attempt um, to work Marx's various statements about um, the, the, the world outside Europe uh, into a, a kind of coherent framework um, is very exciting. And, uh, and I am uh, grateful for, for this really uh, stimulating and, and um, and well thought out presentation. Um, but I'm gonna ask a question that, that maybe in, in view of this, in view of your, the, the breadth of your discussion uh, seems a little small hearted. So forgive me for that uh, if, it, if it seems that way. But I was intrigued by your way of, of framing your uh, distance to uh, various highly influential interpretations of Marx by talking about how uh, the Marx, his, his idea of the fetish as you see it, or his idea of labor as you see it, the exploitation of labor has itself been fetishized. And, um, you know, the language is very suggestive there. And uh, I was wondering if you could just um, walk me through that a little bit, um, since it, it, uh, it was stated initially, and then you were um, proceeded to your, your reading. Yes. Shall we collect? Well, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Maybe I'll ask a question too. Okay, um, yeah. If that's good, you want to do two at once? Why not? Yeah, so, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, terrific. Well, it really opened up a whole new horizon for me. I do think thinking of the field of analysis as global and the field of struggle as global, it fits my understanding of Marx. A lot of that doesn't make it into volume one of Capital explicitly, but it's all over his journalism, his letters, his involvements. So that, that really makes perfect sense. But in terms of revolutionary possibilities, and I'm really glad you brought that up, I take your question to be something like, um, do the redistribution of relations relations of production, but also of exploitation. So exploitation has moved around. It's not just within the factory, but in all different places, under all different conditions. It's kind of, there's a division of exploitation, I would say today, that's different than in Marx's time or different than he recognized. Your question is something like, does this redistribution change the analysis of capital, maybe even the categories? And does it also then change the anti-capitalist possibilities? And your, your position is that, well, Marx was already there in a lot of ways, and we should turn to those and exploit them in order to help um, fight the struggle. Here's, here's a problem I see. Um, 
he was thinking of a collective action. And the cooperation chapter really makes this clear over and over and over again. Um, he was thinking the, the unity of space and time for cooperation on the labor floor is really because the power that the collective gets is because they are facing one particular capitalist who then needs them as a collective because it's more efficient. If the people who pull the um, iron ore out of the earth um, obstruct the making, the steelworks, that's one thing, but it doesn't count as cooperation or as collective action. Let's say the means of production is not included in that for Marx. So um, my question is something like, does the image of a chain bring with it different possibilities, a different kind of struggle? And if so, you know, how fair is that? If the collective strikes, everyone sits out and what happens happens. But if the logistic workers, the immigrant logistics workers, if we're depending on them alone to disrupt the supply chain, that seems, it seems highly unfair, very dangerous for them and different than a revolution. So maybe you could respond to that mess that I just threw in your, in your hands. Yeah. Okay. I think I should uh, try to respond. Thank you to the two polls. <laughs> okay, so the, um, thank you for your, for your um, stimulating questions. So um, the first question is really about uh, my critique of certain interpretations of Marxist uh, capital. So the idea that um, the fact, so the criticism, for example, that he's just looking at labor power or exploitation and this would close off both the analysis of uh, social reproduction and the analysis of um, resistance. And I think this is a kind of very reductionist interpretation of the antagonism between capital and wage labor. And uh, I include here authors I really admire, like for example, Maria Mies or Claudio from Verloff and others, uh, femi feminist scholars, who also say, well, this antagonism between wage labor and capital doesn't include, uh, is not a gendered antagonism. So we can't understand the question of gender in the, in the light of, of Marx's analysis. And I think that this underestimates first what, what this kind of exchange of labor power for a wage is about. So that uh, one, uh, workers are exchanging their, li their living power. So their, their power as species, uh, species being. I, I just left uh, like um, a passage from, from Marx in the Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts when he argues that labor is life activity, is, pro is the productive life itself, is the life of the species, is life engendering life. So it's really, so by, by selling their labor power, it's this, it's this power, this, this living power of, of the species that is appropriated by capital. And that's why the complete relationship between hum, humankind and, and nature is overthrown. So it's subordinated under the needs of accumulation. And this also includes uh, the reproduction of the species. Another point is that, um, for example, uh, scholars like, um, I don't know how long I should go, but uh, scholars like uh, Lisa Vogel, for example, believe that Marx isn't looking at a global system in Capital Volume 1, but national economy. So since you have migration and other forms of social reproduction, um, social reproduction cannot be included in, in Volume 1. But of course, if we agree that he's looking really at the national economy, or at the global economy or a globalized system or so on, then the, I think the, uh, the dimension of this antagonism is different. And the, the, the second point I think is that um, I want to highlight in answering this question is the question of cooperation, which I think is a very underestimated aspect of Marx's analysis. So I think that even the idea that by focusing on exploitation Marx would close off spaces of resistance, 
underestimates the fact that for Marx, value production is based on cooperation and cooperation empowers the workers. So if we don't understand this, I think we are closing up of the spaces of resistance uh, in our interpretations of capital. Um, thanks. If I just might uh, jump in for, or may jump in for a, a second. Uh, I, I suppose um, what, what uh, interested me about your uh, likening of these misreadings or you're framing them as, as a kind of like fetishizing of the, uh, the, the fetish um, idea to an extent um, is that it raises the question of what it is about Marx's presentation, language, framing, and so on uh, that in, encourages misreadings um, or is that so? In other words, uh, for, for him, you know, that's uh, certainly true of, of capitalism. Um, the, the way it works uh, is such that uh, people misunderstand it, um, take some things for others. Um, uh, sometimes it, it appears to have fantastic forms because it in fact appears to have fantastic forms, but this also throws people off. And so um, that's what I'm, I'm uh, I, I perhaps should have said that a little more clearly in answer, answer, asking the question initially, but um, what is your, your sense of that? Um, how, is there something about the, uh, obviously people come to Marx with agendas and uh, you know, it, it's all <clears throat> very freighted, um, but is, is uh, and the argument is of course difficult, which you could say is something that, you know, lends itself to misunderstanding. Um, but you find that there's something about the, the framing of it, the language and so on that, that lends itself to, uh, to misreadings. The passage, one of the passages that you had us discuss or think about and respond to, for example, you said you thought about it for a long time and you see how it could be read in either ways, do you th in, in multiple ways. Do you think that that's uh, fairly typical? Um, and, uh, and that's to an extent the, the, the source of this? Yeah. Well, the first thing to say is that Marx's focus in Capital Volume 1 is not about social reproduction. So I think uh, clearly he's focusing on the production process. Um, and, and so this could give the impression that he's looking at at these rather than at the kind of trying to analyze the totality of, of capitalist social relations. And I think that uh, there has been a tendency also in the interpretations of, of Capital Volume 1 to see it as restricted to le the level of the factory, yeah, or the national economy. And so this, this kind of interpretation may have influenced a certain idea uh, of, of its object of analysis. Um, I also think well, we can find um, Marx's attention to these in his notebooks, for example, or especially well, already in the early 50s, he's looking at issues of, um, of the relationship between the family and uh, the different modes of production. And, and then he's going back to these in the late uh, period of his life uh, with his uh, what so-called ethnological notebooks and that were used then by Angus when he uh, edited the origin of the family, private property and the state. So, um, well, I would say it's a question of focus. It's a question probably of the language due to the fact that um, that's not the main uh, um, object of analysis. And also maybe one, one thing that is true that, as I said, it's really in the late 60s and uh, early 70s in the wake of the strikes in France and the Paris Commune and, and so on, that he starts to stress this, this issue of the kind of centrality of women in the struggle. Well, I think there is a language in capital that somehow reflects a, a sort of nostalgia for the kind of manufacturing male worker and some form of kind of traditional family relations. So there is also this aspect that I think um, is a factor that changes uh, later on. I don't think I satisfied you, but... Uh, no, 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 I'm, I'm just thinking. I, I, I don't mean to, to look skeptical. Thank you so much. And, and okay. I'll let you move on to Paul's question. 
Well, Paul question, I think, uh, uh, Paul North uh, question. <laughs> so I think it's a, it's a very important question because, um, yes, um, okay, there are two things that I want to highlight here. One is the question whether the, the kind of global redistribution of uh, workers today and the kind of restructuring of production really um, changes uh, Marx's analysis uh, and also about the revolutionary possibilities. Well, on the one side, I would say it doesn't change it. It's actually, I see, <laughs> as I think that he's not looking at um, 19th century England, but as a, I believe he's posing this uh, completely globalized system, yeah, where capitalist production has established itself everywhere. So I think that um, what we are witnessing today is actually an approximation to this limit that is uh, posing in capital. And so, for example, the fact that production has industrial production has relocated to the south and the west, uh, like uh, in Europe and the U.S. and Japan, have lost their industrial monopoly has actually globalized industrial competition. And so this is uh, manifesting the impoverish, uh, impoverishing uh, tendencies of the system in a much clearer way. So this is actually allowing um, uh, the development of these tendencies uh, to unfold, or these tendencies to unfold. But I agree with you that I think that's actually the key. So, and I think there is an ambiguity in Marx himself about this concept of cooperation. Because on the one side, there is this idea that there is uh, some form of unity of space and time. And so cooperation would emerge from this, right? And so this helps explain the kind of very optimistic tone of the, of the end of the, of the part of the expropriation of the expropriators. So the idea that actually, so there is this kind of cooperation that grounds working class organization, consciousness, and, and so on. On the other side, I think that uh, there is still um, this form of unity, space and time unity, even if we look at this entire supply chain, right? Not just uh, because of the disruption of logistics, but for example, Beverly Silver uh, shows that, uh, especially given just-in-time production, um, even if we stop uh, a part of the supply chain, this can have a disruptive potential all over the chain, right? Can I ask a question about that, yeah. just while yeah. you're on it? Just thinking of Marx's presentation of cooperation in volume one, it really is that the collective faces off against one capitalist who owns their means of production. So what's to keep Apple from, say there's resistance at some point in the supply chain, just shifting the supplier? That's what can't happen, let's say, in this uh, workspace where the capitalist absolutely needs everyone to be working together in order to get their return. And they can't do it otherwise. So if the cooperation breaks down there, it's tantamount to them losing their business or not, you know, becoming impossible for them to continue as a capitalist, whereas Apple can simply change their suppliers. But I mean, isn't it the same thing that Marx was describing in the um, address to the Lausanne Congress? So that in order to face uh, worker struggles, uh, English capitalists were moving production to countries where wages were lower. So it's, it's, it's the same. Sorry, I don't hear you. I just think it's a very specific argument about cooperation that leads to an idea of collective action and the idea of revolution as a kind of overthrow of one capitalist or of the whole system. And well, if the, um, the relocated manufacturer, let's say, is still um, directly responsible for the capitalist's profit, that's fine, then it works. But insofar as they can simply switch suppliers, so that's where Marx makes the difference between means of production and production. I don't mean to get very technical. I only think it's worth sticking with Marx's framework and developing other vocabulary 
and other revolutionary possibilities that you brought up. But disruption is very different than overthrow is very different than crisis. It's not actually a term I think that Marx uses, disruption, blockade. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, well, I think that the, um, I mean, the, the power for disruption, I mean, it's not a term that he uses, but we can explain the power for disruption to co through cooperation because it's the fact that uh, the division of labor is uh, so developed means that uh, it requires increasing cooperation yeah, in order to produce a product. And this uh, creates uh, possibilities for disruption. So I think it's um, um, directly proportional to the process of cooperation. Okay, I think that's a great, that's a great answer. Uh, maybe it's a good time to turn to a couple of questions from students in the seminar, and then we can open up the, the floor to other people. I know there's a lot of comments and questions. I want to turn to uh, Bilal, who's a student in the seminar. Audrey, if you're hearing me, would you open up his mic? Yes, can you repeat their name, please? Yeah, it's Bilal Moin, M-O-I-N. Yeah, he's unmuted. Uh, I had a question about, about cooperation. Um, so when Marx describes the subjugation of colonies, he often you know, brings up the, the divisory schisms in society that the capitalist you know, creates and takes advantage of when he oppresses the masses. And this is made quite evident when he talks about the uh, Indian Sepoy mutiny of 1857. And he, he specifically references the British divide at emperor policies. Uh, so given that uh, Marx describes the unity of masters uh, and the value of the unity of masses to overcome cooperation, uh, does he see cooperation as only a tool to oppress the workers, or could it also be an agency of freedom, specifically in this context? Thank you. Should we go on to some more questions? You want to collect yes. them? Okay, great. Um, why don't we go to Nancy? So that's there's only one student who proposed a question. So anyone else from the seminar who wants to um, pop a question in the chat, we can come back to you. <clears throat> but we can go now to Nancy Ko. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm Nancy. I'm a, a PhD student at Columbia, actually. Um, so I'm curious as to um, whether you can talk about your interpretation as it might relate to Moshe Pastone's um, in Time, Labor, and Social Capital. The reason I bring up Pastone's interpretation of Marx is that um, I think one thing that's sort of bothering me in the way that we're talking about labor here is that we're only talking about it in its sort of concrete aspects. So we're talking about, for example, Apple's laborers. Um, but for Pastone, importantly, in Capital, um, labor is both concrete, a thing that produces use values, but also socially general and abstract and produces value as the form of wealth and capitalism. So I wonder if this might partially account for the difficulty of, of um, revolution, interpreting that as we may, precisely that um, labor you know, in only its concrete form, in, or interpreted only in its concrete form, escapes this other aspect of, of labor. And then um, with regard to kind of this sort of one of your last slides about um, what to do with Marxist capital today, I think Pastone would say that, I mean, he recently passed away, but I think he would say that um, Marx is more relevant now than ever, not just because capital, as you said, um, wasn't just a historical account, but a, a, a sort of theory of a system. But I, I, I wonder if you could speak specifically to his idea of sort of the kind of treadmill effect, right? Um, so the ways in which um, due to the kind of temporally determined nature of value, um, value becomes you know, uh, distributed ever more thinly across a kind of ever growing sum of commodities. And so on that account of the treadmill effect, um, proletarian labor becomes increasingly anachronistic, right? Um, and so in contrast, material wealth, right? Like the super billionaires like Jeff Bezos, um, their material wealth becomes ever easy to accommodate, accumulate rather, at the same time that um, the value of proletarian labor becomes increasingly irrelevant 
to their resistance. So I wonder, because we're bringing up this whole troubling thing of the fact that the very people that we think Marx holds responsible for the possibility of revolution are also the most vulnerable. I don't think that he's holding them responsible for that revolution. I don't think that he sees or he saw the proletariat class as the standpoint of the critique. I think as Postone says, Capital is a critique of labor in capitalism, not a critique of capital from the standpoint of labor. Do you want to go from here or do you want to take one more? I would take one more. Yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Nancy. I want to invite Berta Murata to ask their question. Berta, yeah. would you like to go ahead? Yeah. I can also read out the question for you if you prefer. They might be, they're unmuted, I can see that, but they might be having trouble with mics or whatever. Why don't I read the question? It came a little while ago. It says, how can the reading of capital help challenge the productive forces for example, in extraction of iron ore in Kiruna, where workers are highly paid and extraction outputs or appropriation ever increasing. It's the biggest iron ore mine in the world. I guess they wanna know how capital can be useful in challenging that, where it's getting bigger and bigger and the, I guess the exploitation is not as obvious. Professor Pradella, I'll leave this to you now. Okay, to thank you. Thank you everyone for, for these questions. Um, yes, Bilal, um, I'm not sure I, I, fully, I fully understood, but uh, I definitely agree that um, there is this important emancipatory dimension of Marx's analysis of cooperation. And um, yes, so this also applies, of course, uh, to, to the colonies. Uh, regarding the question about um, labor in capital and uh, Postone's interpretation, well, I think that well, the, the interpretation I put forward is actually quite um, the opposite uh, to Postone's. First, because uh, as, as regard uh, with regard to con concrete and abstract labor, I think that um, I mean, from my point of view, I'm not an expert on Postone, but uh, it seems to fetishize capital and um, basically um, overlook the dialectic between concrete and abstract labor. And what I wanted to say in particular was that the reduction of concrete labor to abstract labor is a violent process that takes place in the production process, right? That uh, helps explain also workers' revolt yeah and opposition to the development of the productive forces and uh, the idea that uh, marx uh, that capital is a book um, in which basically capital is a subject from my point of view completely overlooks the fact that in the section in the part on capital reproduction marx says that if we look at the reproduction of the relationship capital is just objectified dead labor right so from from the point of view of the totality it's the working class that reproduces itself as dependent on capital and so the power to change things today is still the power of the working class from my point of view and this is because um, they control the production process and this has become even more clear today in the wake of the pandemic how important workers are uh, how, for example, there is a McKinsey report that shows that uh, because of national, natural disasters, climate change and stuff like that, um, corporations are going to stop um, a month. Uh, they have a disruption of one month every seven years. And this will cost them a huge amount of money. I don't remember how much money, but I couldn't believe it. So the idea that the, the, see, both the workers and, of course, the natural disasters caused by capitalism can produce such, such a disruption, I think, helps explain, uh, so because of their structural power, why the workers today still have uh, this power. 
and they are showing this. Maybe it's uh, more difficult for us in, in Europe or in the West, but um, Chinese workers, uh, Indian workers and so on have been engaged in waves of uh, labor unrest over the last decades. And this has uh, led to concrete improvements in, in, their, in their conditions. So it's not like um, the class struggle has disappeared. I think this is also maybe a bit of a Eurocentric um, point of view that, that leads uh, to this uh, conclusion. And uh, yes, so regarding extractivism and how can we understand exploitation or how can Marx criticize um, the productive forces if there is extractivism, maybe natural degradation, but at the same time wages are relatively high. I don't think, well, I think that in order to understand this point, we need to look at uh, Marx's theory of wage, of the wage that has actually different dimensions. So Marx differentiates the nominal wage, the real wage, and the relative wage, yeah? So you can even have very high wages relatively. For example, let's say Harry Ford, when he inaugurated the assembly line, um, he said, well, he had the problem because workers didn't want to work there anymore because labor conditions were so awful, right? And so he said, well, the only way to keep workers here is to raise the wage to the $5 a, a day. And he says, well, this has basically been the best uh, uh, measure to cut labor costs that I have uh, ever taken, right? So by increasing wages, he has cut labor costs, reduced labor costs. Why? Because of increased productivity. So in relative terms, the relative wage of the workers, still they could earn $5 a, a day, they could buy their Ford car, maybe after, I don't know, one or two years. But in relative terms, in comparison to Ford's profits, they had actually become poorer, right? And I think that this can apply to different contexts, like the one, the, the examples you made, but also if we look at, for example, a Chinese workers today, because of their struggles, they have achieved, many of them industrial workers have achieved improvements in their real wages, but still inequality is skyrocketing in, in China. Because, because uh, why? Because of this difference between the relative wage and the real wage, which is basically workers' purchasing power. Um, if I could respond to um, one of your points. So, I, I mean, I, I take the point about uh, sort of Pastone kind of fetishizing or perhaps re-fetishizing um, capital in Capital and his interpretation of Capital. But I, I, I don't know, there's something that seems to me a little bit too optimistic about your account because um, let's, I mean, let's take the environment and, and global warming and, and climate change, which I appreciate how central it, it sort of, it was in your presentation. Um, I think that it's not enough to think that the deleterious effects of climate change can be sort of overrun by efforts of working class alone, right? The reality is that there are large corporations <laughs> that are responsible for the vast majority of carbon emissions um, in the, sorry, be in the world today. And I think precisely what Postone is trying to point out, that Marx is trying to point out, fine, take away the part about capital being the subject of his critique. What he's trying to point out is that there's an increasing disconnect between the working class as the enabling sort of factor of, uh, of capital production, as you point out, on the one hand, and then, uh, you know, value on the other hand, right? Like, I, I, I so, so I, I wonder if from the perspective of a corporation, you know, having to lose income for one month every seven years just becomes a new norm. It doesn't become a sort of disabling um, uh, uh, sort of factor. I think that precisely what Deepesh Chakrabarty and Amitav Ghosh have pointed out with regard to climate change is that it, it, it forces us to contend with problems for which the will of the working class alone is not enough. Maybe I'm being too pessimistic though. <laughs> yes, but I don't, uh, I don't understand if you expect uh, Bezos or whoever to change their mind and suddenly, you know, say, well, we want a different system. I mean, that's not what I'm saying. 
I'm, I'm not saying that it's just the working class. I think the working class is the center of such a transformation. I think what, what I'm trying to say, even with the examples of anti-racism and the kind of different uh, kind of struggles is that it's, I, I believe, or the question about production and reproduction, it's like, it's just like having a focus on production doesn't exclude all the other spheres of the total social reproduction of a society. So the point is, uh, we need to unite struggles around production and reproduction, around uh, racism, imperialism, and so on. And, and the, the, I think that the real change, social change, can take place when they also expand to production. When there are, I mean, when there is a kind of alliance or a connection between um, the, these struggles that also involves the, the, the workers. I mean, this is, this is what happens, happened in the 70s um, in, in many countries. It was the, the connection between students, workers, women, and so on, that were able to actually achieve some improvements. I, I just believe we, we forget this. Uh, and we have a very reductionist interpretation of our labor struggles. So on, on the contrary, the idea is like that even anti-imperialist resistance is a force that uh, is not external to the, the class struggle. So it's a, it's a much broader and dynamic conception of the class struggle from my point of view that includes peasants, small peasants uh, and, and dispossessed uh, people. And, and so on. So it's, um, I think, um, but I don't think that the corporation will change their mind or attitude. So I wouldn't expect much from them. Shall we take a couple more questions? Yes. Okay, I'm going to, forgive me if I missed your question somewhere in the queue. If I did, you can repost it towards the bottom and I'll get to it. I'm gonna read for Felix Buchwald, whose mic is not working. This question, would you agree that Marx's own analysis appears to show why a completely globalized capitalist system is an impossibility? His analysis of the centralization of capital could be an example. As you noted, this process necessarily marginalizes particular world regions. What might this imply for your interpretation of the passage from chapter 24 on treating the world as one nation? Perhaps there's a fourth possible interpretation. You can you can read this yourself in the in the chat. It's complicated. Sorry, can you? This is Felix Buchwald. It's a little bit, I don't know, ten entries up from the bottom, in the Oh no, that's just to me. I'll repost it to the whole group. Oh, thank you. Uh, and then while we're mulling that one over, can we go to Baruch Jimenez Contreras? Who has a question? Can we unmute Baruch? Did you find him? Baruch, he may us. Is there a mic working? I don't know. Baruch, are you are you here? Do you listen to me? Do you listen to me? Yes. Welcome. yes. Yes. Uh, uh, I, I want to, to ask you, what do you think about the change in the viewpoint of the Marxist research in the United States, which previously focused on the study of economic trends, like the, the investigation of Farah and Suisi, and now has a more humanistic and open perspective like Melanie Foster? Thank you for that. Great, for the moment, that's all our questions. Okay, thank you. Um, can I ask um, the person who posted this question about the centralization of capital, maybe uh, to explain what they mean that um, the centralization of capital is an example of why a completely globalized system is um, impossible. That's for Felix Buchwald. 
maybe give some more explanation where you see this in Marx's analysis, that a completely globalized system is an impossibility. And maybe while he does that, do you want to go on to Baruch's question? Could be. Lucia. Uh, okay. Um, well, that's an interesting question. I had never really thought about the develop this development of uh, Marxist scholarship in, in the United States. But I, well, I, I know the, the work by Sweezy and, and so on. And I actually think that um, Bellamy Foster has quite a kind of, um, it's an interesting global approach in, in the sense that he's uh, analyzing different aspects of Marxist analysis from the reserve army to the uh, metabolic rift uh, and now, for example, COVID-19. So I, I hadn't thought about it in, in these terms, but it's uh, surely something interesting to think about. Okay, I don't see Felix expanding on his question or oh, completely globalized as opposed to a tendentially globalizing or oh, tending, tending to globalize. I see the distinction he's making is between your reading of Marx as capturing this tendency and then the idea of a completely globalized system. Yeah, so on the one side, I agree in the sense that, um, for example, seeing even the idea of, um, of the centralization of capital, Marx talks about this process of centralization that tends towards basically the concentration of property, of the property of capital in the hands of uh, a single capital within a given society. Yeah, so he, he talks in, this, in these terms when he talks about the process of centralization. So he sees this tendency towards centralization, but at the same time, of course, this is always a competitive process because capital only exists in competition with other capitals. So I don't uh, put forward here the idea of, a, for example, of ultra imperialism, yeah, that would lead to a single process of centralization. So what I'm arguing here is that because there is always the link to the national economy and the state, this ten tendency towards centralization uh, at the global level actually enhances the competitive pressure between different uh, um, capital is linked to specific uh, nation states. Yeah. And so I see this as an expression of a kind of, the kind of um, tensions uh, and tendency towards inter-imperialist conflicts uh, expressed exactly by this on the one side, the tendency towards uh, the kind of the global level and on the other side, the continuing presence of uh, competition, uh, which is inherent in the process of uh, accumulation. But uh, um, with regard to the idea that the process ma necessarily marginalizes particular world regions, that's what I'm not completely sure about, or I agree with, because um, I don't understand what you mean by marginalization, because uh, I, I understand this marginalization as an expression of the integration of these regions in the capitalist uh, world market, not as an expression of their exclusion from it. Yeah, so for example, underdevelopment is the result of the development. It's, it's a part and parcel of capitalist development on, on a global scale that, rather than a result of a lack of development. So these are why I wanted to hear from you, but uh, for sure, there is a fourth possible interpretation, and uh, well, uh, maybe we could uh, we will discuss it in, in future. Can I ask you on that line, just for your bigger picture? Do you think that the struggle is a contingent thing? It sounds like it's quite fragmentary. It happens here. It happens there. Or do you think? like some interpretation, some Marxist views, development is happening. And when it gets to a certain point, there'll be a general 
obstruction, a general disruption. It's like asking you to predict the US election. But <laughs> I'm curious how you see it moving, not whether you think it's going to happen one way or the other. How does, is it a systemic issue? Is it a matter of necessity as the fetishists of capital think it will be? Uh, is it, but if it's purely contingent, it's hard to imagine that struggles in, in many different places, even if they happen all at once, would be anything other than absorbed one way or the other back into capitalist strategies. Well, I think it's difficult to answer this question without bringing in the question of organization. Yes, in the sense that I think what we have witnessed, for example, over the last 20 years is, for example, big defeats yeah, of the United States and Europe in Afghanistan, in Iraq. So this, I mean, there has been local resistance that has led to um, basically quite substantial defeats. Uh, but at the same time, uh, and this in my, from my point of view, or for example, the new waves of social struggles in Latin America with the pink tide and so on, this has also uh, weakened the imperialist system from some points of, some points of view. So it has, uh, these factors have enhanced the factors of crisis in the centers of the system. And you have Brzezinski and others that say that quite clearly. So we have this awakening of the people in the global south. And this is something we need to deal with because it's a problem for us, right? So we, so we had these struggles that have weakened uh, the system and in my view have exacerbated the factors that led to the global economic crisis in, in 2008. But at the same time, what's missing here is an international. And so I think that even for these to then lead to a kind of broader revolutionary transformation globally, so we need, the, as, as Lenin said once, it's the subjective uh, side that it's always the biggest problem. Thanks, that's great. Well, sign me up for the international, and I bet you'd have a lot of people in the audience there too. Maybe since there aren't um, further questions, there's another question that I think is pretty marginal about genetics and pathology. I don't really think that's relevant. You can answer it if you want to. Uh, otherwise, we can thank you. Well, here's, here's another question. Do you want to take that one? Do you see it? As the industrialization takes place both in the developed and developing world, does that affect the disruptive potential workers have, have thanks to cooperation? Does the increasing absorption of workers by personal services sector undermine the disruptive force? Well, I think as, as I tried to, to discuss, the dynamics of workers' power is complex, yeah? So, for example, the industrialization and the shift of production can weaken workers in a specific area, like um, the industrialized area, while at the same time can create new uh, centers of production and disruption, like for example, the shift of production to East Asia. Uh, at the same time, uh, also the fact that uh, this is based on logistics and connections and so on can also create sources of power, like for example, uh, of logistics, logistics struggle. And so, for example, Beverly Silver differentiates the weakening of organized labor at the labor market level, or even at the association in terms of associational power that we have witnessed in, in Europe and in the United States over the last 40 years. But at the same time, you can have even um, certain, uh, you can have new sources of power, like the example of the logistics or, or so on. So this is, this, is a, this is a process that it's a contradictory process. I, I wouldn't just give a, 
uh, single answer. So I thought that, for example, the answer the audience gave about uh, COVID-19 was, was quite good. So I, I do think that it, it creates both, uh, it both weakens and creates new sources of power. And in terms of personal services sector, um, well, I think this is a personal services. What, what do you mean exactly? Maybe the service sector in general. Mm which in the, at least from the U.S. perspective has become a very huge, it's taken over where industry used to be. Yeah. Uh, catering, care work, food services. Well, uh, for example, uh, in terms of um, food services or or even um catering and, and so on i don't i don't think it necessarily reduces the power of disruption well per se because for example services that cannot be outsourced um so in services that cannot be outsourced workers can still have quite a lot of disruptive power i think key to kind of long-term successes is probably to link these struggles also to struggles in production so they people sense that you're about to leave and that's making them anxious and ask really good questions so if you don't mind taking a couple more yes do you okay so let's read out or maybe i'll just read them out just yeah. to think um, Vanessa Arapko, how do you think Engels and Marx differed on their analysis of gender issues? And then I'll point out Vanessa Gubbins's question. Um, do you have thoughts about the limits to accumulation? How do you think about that limit? What potential might it have? And there's finally a question about automation, whether automation will undermine workers leverage globally. That's from Michael Pulsford. Okay. Um, how do you think Angus and Max different, differed on their analysis of gender issues? Mm. I need to think about this, uh, social reproduction. It's very broad. Uh, so what do you think about it? Um, well, the first thing I would say, I mean, about this point is that if we compare the Marxist notebooks on gender and the family and um, Angus's origin of the private, private property, the family and the state, sorry guys, uh, it's 11 o'clock here. So. Uh, so if we compare the two, the first thing I would say is that Angus had more of a kind of evolutionist uh, outlook, while uh, Marx was also more interested in the kind of persistence of different forms of gender relations and social relations around the world. Uh, for example, in pre-capitalist societies in the early uh, 1880s. So one thing I would uh, highlight um, about this difference, which, is, which isn't which is something I have really investigated so far, is that um, I think especially in the late years of his life, Marx was looking much more at the kind of different so, so forms of social and gender relations existing globally, and looking also at the, their potential in terms of social transformation, right? So the idea that social transformation doesn't originate only within capitalism, but also in forms of opposition to, to capitalism. And, and so 
probably this um, less evolution evol evolutionistic uh, approach is something I would highlight about about Marx. But I'm I'm not really uh, I haven't studied this in great depth. Well, would thank you. Like you. To, maybe we should suspend now, given how late it is there. And Zoom gives you the the idea that you can exploit people without stopping. So maybe we should give you a chance to rest. What I can ask people to do whose questions haven't been answered yet is send them to me. You can find me in the German department at Yale and I can forward them to Professor Pradella, if that's okay with you, Lucia. Yes, that's all right. Okay, why don't we do that? And we thank Professor Pradella for a really thought-inspiring presentation. This would be the huge applause, thunderous applause. Thank you. Okay.